We're finishing up our discussion on how we learn by talking about the mind-body connection because it does matter. So one of the things that we ask is, how do you sleep or do you sleep? I can remember saying sleep, you know, I'll sleep, uh, I'll sleep when I graduate or something like that. It's probably not true. There's lots of reasons that we're not getting enough sleep. We study a lot, we're working, we're studying, we have family, and all of these things take away from our time. And so we have a deficit in our sleep, but it's important to understand why we sleep. My name is Matthew Walker. I am a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and I am the author of the book, Why We Sleep. We certainly know that a lack of sleep will actually prevent your brain from being able to initially make new memories. So it's almost as though without sleep, the memory inbox of the brain shuts down and you can't commit new experiences to memory. So those new incoming informational emails are just bounced and you end up feeling as though you're amnesic. You can't essentially make and uh, create those new memories. We also know that a lack of sleep will lead to an increased development of a toxic protein in the brain that is called beta amyloid. And that is associated with Alzheimer's disease because it is during deep sleep at night when a sewage system within the brain actually kicks into high gear and it starts to wash away this toxic protein, beta amyloid. So if you're not getting enough sleep each and every night, more of that Alzheimer's related protein will build up. The more protein that builds up, the greater your risk of going on to develop dementia in later life. What are the effects of sleep deprivation on the body? Well, there are many different effects. Firstly, we know that sleep deprivation affects the reproductive system. We know that men who are sleeping just five to six hours a night have a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years their senior. So a lack of sleep will age you by almost a decade in terms of that aspect of virility and wellness. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your immune system. So after just one night of four to five hours of sleep, there is a 70% reduction in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells. And that's the reason that we know that short sleep duration predicts your risk for developing numerous forms of cancer. And that list currently includes cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, as well as cancer of the breast. In fact, the link between a lack of sleep and cancer is now so strong that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. So in other words, jobs that may induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. We also know that a lack of sleep impacts your cardiovascular system because it is during deep sleep at night that you receive this most wonderful form of effectively blood pressure medication. Your heart rate drops, your blood pressure goes down. If you're not getting sufficient sleep, you're not getting that reboot of the cardiovascular system. So your blood pressure rises. You have, if you're getting six hours of sleep or less, a 200% increased risk of having a fatal heart attack or a stroke in your lifetime. There is a global experiment that is performed on 1.6 billion people twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. And we know that in the spring, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. Another question perhaps is, what is the recycle rate of a human being? How long can we actually last without sleep before we start to see declines in your brain function or even impairments within your body? And the answer seems to be about 16 hours of wakefulness. Once you get past 16 hours of being awake, that's when we start to see mental deterioration and physiological deterioration in the body. 
We know that after you've been awake for 19 or 20 hours, your mental capacity is so impaired that you would be as deficient as someone who is legally drunk behind the wheel of a car. So if you were to ask me what is the recycle rate of a human being, it does seem to be about 16 hours and we need about eight hours of sleep to repair the damage of wakefulness. Wakefulness essentially is low level brain damage. Oops, we don't want to listen to that again. Uh, although I always like listening to Brits. Uh, all right, so sleep impacts our learning. So when you don't get enough sleep, it impacts your memory. Encoding is the process um, or encoding information learned in class is far more challenging without pro proper sleep. So in other words, if you're tired, you may hear what's being said, but it's not staying in. It's, um, your parents may have said to you, I say this to my kids, it went in one ear and out the other. You're listening-ish, but you're not processing the information. Storage. So new information that you learn is fragile and susceptible to interference before we kind of pack it into long-term memory. Memories are consolidated during sleep, so without sleep, you may lose the information. Retrieval is the, is the part of learning that matters maybe most. And it's also the one that's most impacted by lack of sleep. So retrieval just means it's that muscle memory. Where do we find information? How do we get there? We're teaching our brain that muscle memory of where that information is located. And if you don't get sleep, you don't um, teach your brain to retrieve the information. All right, so exercise is also important to learn the learning process. There's these things called brain-derived neurotropic factor. And it's really just a protein in the brain that helps you to learn new material. And it's manufactured when you exercise. So if you're not exercising, guess what? You don't have enough of this protein. It strengthens the connections made between your neurons, allowing you students to retrieve the answer to the questions easier and faster so exercise is important and it's hard because when we're in school and we have school and work and family exercise is often one of the first things to go but you need to make sure you have enough exercise to create the BDNF so that you're able to actually learn new information so if you're not exercising you don't have the protein you're less likely to access that information Severe stress and anxiety can and, do, and does cause the brain to go into survival mode and prevents new information from moving into the prefrontal cortex. So one of the things I tell my creative writing students is the human brain is wired for story. And the number one thing to the human brain is anthropological and that's survival. And so story is essentially how do we survive? And if you're under severe stress, your body anthropologically is taking in as much information, sensory information as it can because you need to know where the danger is. But a lot of modern stress, like school, um, our brain isn't wired to handle that information. So the more stress we have, the more information we're taking in, the less we're actually learning this new information um, and moving it to where it needs to be for retrieval. So Trying to figure out your stresses and eliminate them will help you improve your grades. So here's the takeaways from this second shorter video. Your overall wellness is a major factor in your academic success. You need sleep. You need exercise. Um, you need to try and find ways to eliminate stress. Sleep is vital. It helps you with your focus in class, your memory so that you re can recall it. And, and it's really important before a test or an exam not to cram for it, but instead to make sure that you've already done the incremental things for your comprehension and retrieval so that you can get a good night's sleep. Stress is inevitable. It's, we live in a very stressful, busy world, but it's invisible. And sometimes if we're not paying attention, we don't see how it's impacting us. 
one way to focus yourself before class is to uh, to spend 60 seconds um, doing a breathing exercise or a mind dump to help yourself focus. What I do for my creative writing students is a one minute um, or two minute mindfulness exercise where I have them pick one object in their environment and write as many sensory details as they can about this object. So pick it up. What does it feel like? If it's, a, you know, if it's something that we taste, what does it taste like, look like, smell like, feel like? All of those things, all of our sensory details, when we focus on that one object, what we're telling our brain is, you don't have to look for danger. There's no danger here. And, and so you can focus on one thing. It improves your focus if you can do that. So these are ways or tools that you can take into your other classes and this class to improve your comprehension, improve your grade, improve your learning, and eliminate some of your stress as students. There's references here if you want to look up any of this information.